Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. We believe this is an historic event here. Uh, Dr. Paul is rolling out his plan to restore America. Real spending cuts, real regulatory reform, extensive tax relief, bringing the troops home, ending this overseas nation building. The only president with a plan to balance the budget in one term, the only president with a plan that can restore our great country. With no further ado, my hero, next president of the United States, Congressman Ron Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you coming, and I appreciate the press for being here. And I'll be available for 30 minutes to take questions. But I want to uh, make the announcement that I am here today to uh, release a plan that I have for balancing the budget and cutting in the first year $1 trillion. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about our problems that we have, we're facing. But they're worldwide, and the big problem is debt. Debt has just been drowning all of us. And yet, all the individuals in the current, can in the, the current candidates, as well as many in Washington, they sort of talk about it, but they talk around it. They talk about cuts. They talk about future cuts. And everything I've heard so far in Washington and from the other candidates has always been cuts in the future. But the future means cuts on the proposed increases. They have like baseline. The baseline is a steady growth of government. And if they cut it, they call, cut the growth, they call that a cut. Well, I don't like that. I think our debt is too big, our government is too big, and that we have to recognize how serious the problem is. Today, though, uh, I don't think there are very many who are as worried about what's happening in the world financial community and in our own uh, finances here in this country. And it's for this reason that I am going to be very determined to present a program that will, that will make a, a difference. A lot of people will say, well, cutting a trillion dollars in one year, that sounds radical. But, you know, I operate on the assumption that the radicals have been in charge way too long. Both from left and right, we have heard the arguments that deficits don't really matter. And they really haven't mattered for a very long time, or we wouldn't have this debt. Uh, but it essentially changed about 40 years ago when we gave license to the Federal Reserve to print money if we needed it. So therefore, there were no restraints on the spending. So if you wanted entitlement spendings to go up or militarism expenditures go up, the Congress just passed it. And they never had to worry about, you know, uh, collecting it in revenues. They say, well, we'll borrow it, and they borrowed a lot. But eventually, they had to print a lot. And as long as the Federal Reserve has been there, they're what I call the facilitator. They facilitate big government. If the Fed wasn't there to print the money when we needed it, this would have ended a long time ago. But it is the appetite for big government that has prompted all this spending. And we have to attack it. Otherwise, we must not believe it's a serious problem. But it is serious. I thought it was serious, and I thought it would lead to a serious problem many, many years ago. And of course, there's a lot more people saying, well, it does sound like it is getting serious in 2008, but it has been bad for over a decade. We've had no new jobs in the last decade, and uh, we've had 30 million new people, and it is not a U.S. problem. We help facilitate the worldwide explosion of debt because we printed a lot of money and we spent, we quit producing, the money goes overseas, it becomes the reserve of all the central banks, and they all have inflated. But the final, the, final, the final fact that makes it stop is debt. The, free, the market is stronger than even the Federal Reserve and governments because you can print and borrow and do all these things and tax, but eventually you drain the productive capacity of the, of the, of the electorate and the people. And this is what's happened. The debt is overwhelming, and yet 
There has been nobody serious about, well, how do you get rid of the debt? You have to cut the spending. And this is what my proposal deals with. And it, it, it's, uh, it's broad, and it has to be broad, because I think we spend everywhere. We cut significantly from the militarism, not one penny from the veterans and not one penny from the defense, from the militarism. It cuts... It cuts all the, all the foreign aid. We don't need foreign aid. We need more help here at home. But we cut a lot of the domestic spending as well. We, we uh, get rid of uh, five departments, and uh, that's a start. Uh, and uh, the, there are, in, the, in these departments that we cut, there are some important places there that we didn't just close down, many of those uh, important parts of each of those departments will be held in, you know, in another department or outside of a, a major department. So nobody gets laid off immediately. They get laid off through attrition because we're going to learn to live with a lot less government and we don't have to keep hiring more and more people to replace those who should be retiring. Our national debt today is going up $4 billion uh, every day, and that's uh, unsustainable. Just to maintain the uh, war in Afghanistan, just in Afghanistan, it's $12 million an hour. I mean, just think of that. And even the generals are coming back, and they're, they're saying, you know, maybe we're halfway. Maybe we've won half of it. Well, from my viewpoint, we're not doing so well. And from the viewpoint of so many of those active military people who have now been supporting our campaign, they're saying, no, it's really time to come home. So, uh, and it, this means from, from every place. And uh, we, we have to address both. The other candidates have not offered this. I don't believe they think it's very serious. They think they can just tinker around the edges. But I think the American people are ready for some honest thinking and honest reforms. And it isn't that difficult for me to do this because I have personal beliefs. Fortunately, my personal beliefs coincide with what the Constitution says. <laughs> So everything that is not explicitly uh, mentioned in the Constitution should be, you know, up for grabs and that we should be able to, uh, to cut it. Yes, and I have uh, taken it upon myself that uh, I will not take a salary any higher than the median income of all Americans, which is $39,000. <laughs> And just, and just to make that point, although I don't generally talk about this very much, but when I first went to Congress in the 1970s, I chose not to participate in the retirement fund because I believed it was abusive and not fair to the taxpayer. We need to do this as well as uh, following up on the reforms we have to have at the Federal Reserve. It doesn't call for the abolishment of the Federal Reserve, uh, but it does call for a real, honest audit of the Fed so we know exactly what they're doing with all that money that they create out of thin air. But it also sets the stage for true reform and phasing out of the Federal Reserve by legalizing your right to constitutional money, competing currencies which would provide the transition. A lot of people will say, well, this is, uh, you know, pretty extreme, pretty excessive, but I go back to the whole thing that I think we have had extreme spending and extremism in the, in the growth of our government, and it's time now we say that we have to cut. And I have a personal conviction 
that this will not hurt anybody. You cut government spending, that goes back to you. You get to spend that money. The people get to spend the money. It isn't spent by the government, and uh, therefore we will have a greater prosperity. This idea, this economic idea, which is, uh, is built based on a great fallacy, and, and the fallacy is that the consumer drives the economy. Well, if you think about that superficially, you say, yeah, that's right. If I go out and buy stuff, then, uh, you know, the manufacturer will have to make it for me. But what if you have 10 credit cards like a lot of Americans have? And what if you don't have a job? What if you don't have any money in the bank? How can you drive the economy? So it has to be different than that. Free market economics teaches that what you want is people to be out of debt and get a job, save money, and then the jobs are created and uh, the supply and demand will provide the products that we need. But this whole idea that you just pass out money and government passes out money, if government spends more money, they've been doing this now for a good many years, really extremely so here since the last four years, since 2007, 2008. The TARP funds and all the, all the Federal Reserve spending, and it hasn't worked because they're not doing the right things. They're doing more of the same thing that caused our crisis. So if we want jobs, we need to get the government out of our way. I deal with this as well on the regulation. We don't need more regulations. We need more regulations on the government is what we really need. <laughs> The proposal protects Social Security beneficiaries, and, uh, but it also does something new because I cut so many other dollars. We can take care of the elderly. The people are dependent on programs such as medical programs and, and the veterans benefits. We can protect that. At the same time, I will offer the young people of this country, 25 and under, they can get out of Social Security if they want to. But basically, a program like this only works if the people endorse it, obviously. One person can't do it, but one person can lead the way. And the one question I would ask all Americans to ponder, and that is, what should the role of government be? And that's what our founders asked. And they asked, and they came up with a decision, and they decided that they didn't like the role of the king. So they wrote a document that said we shouldn't have a king. We should have the people taking care of themselves. We should have a Congress with a lot of responsibility. We shouldn't have a king declaring when we go into war. And that under these circumstances, the government is there to restrain, uh, the Constitution there is to restrain the government. So if we do this, I am absolutely convinced it is the only road to prosperity. More freedom, more prosperity, more government, less liberty, and more poverty. It's no more complex than that. Thank you very much. Everyone, we're gonna we're gonna take just a few minutes to take some questions from our friends in the press that have joined us today. Um, so, if, if uh, there's anyone in the press that would like to please raise your hand, and I'll call on you. And if you could please identify your name and the outlet with your which you're with. Jason. Oh, Anthony. Well, I don't. I didn't say that, but I think it's necessary that I do have democratic health. Obviously, you build coalitions, and uh, I would think the easiest would be on uh, the militarism, you know, overseas, because I've already worked uh, in a coalition in Washington, both with Republicans and Democrats together. We tried hard to prevent some of these wars, and now we work hard to try to end these wars, and uh, go back to a constitutional stance. So I would say the militarism and the corporate. Uh, sometimes people get confused about uh, free market corporations who make honest profits versus corporatism where they live off the taxpayer and get special benefits through the Federal Reserve System and get their bailouts. I think I can get a lot of cooperation on that as well. And those two items are very big in the number of dollars we can save. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a next question? In the back, please. Yes, 
Dr. Said, I wish George Bush tried to privatize Social Security oh. and it didn't go well. Oh, That's not oh okay. No, no, ours is not related to – he was asking about the privatization that President, former President Bush uh, offered uh, as a solution to our Social Security problem. Well, that was when the government maintained uh, accounts and would invest in uh, securities, and I, uh, I wasn't in support of that. Uh, what I'm talking about is opting out, sort of like and a lot of good conservatives and libertarians and constitutional would like to opt out of Obamacare. And I'm just saying opting out sounds like a pretty good slogan. So <laughs> I'd say opt out of Social Security, too. And uh, there's ways to do this when we don't manage it the same way opting out of the all government medical pro all government medical programs, just not the ones the opposition have created. Did you want to follow up? Uh, well, well I, I listed it as 2,500 to get started, uh, but I've announced that in an audience where there were a lot of people over 25, and all they do is, how about including me? But uh, on the campuses, I, I can't remember anybody coming up and saying, hey, I don't want you to do that. Save me. I want to face Social Security because I know it's a good deal. I want to retire on Social Security. Never. <laughs> On the riser, please. Thank you, Carl. Elizabeth from Nevada News Bureau. Dr. Hall, you say that you think that you stand to gain the most important advantage from the Supreme Court in California. Do you think that you should Okay. No, I, I think you make justifiable points, but I would also say that we have to be careful in our definitions because there was a time when conservative meant you didn't want to spend money. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like neoconservatives want endless wars, and they don't want the Congress to make decisions. They want the president to go to wars at will, and that money has, has uh, no bearing. I would say the best confirmation is the support that I get from the active military people and from the veterans. That's, to me, the point. But, but I, think, I think this is different. You, you know, I ran four years ago, and the attitude about the wars – David, the difference of day and night. Uh, now there's a lot more support for it. I mean, we, they, they estimate that $4 trillion of our national debt is because of the wars in the past 10 years. People are sick and tired of the debt, especially when the, the Afghanistan war has been going on 10 years. So people are tired of it, and uh, therefore, yes, there are going to be some diehard neoconservatives who think that uh, fighting another war, a matter of fact, uh, they'd like about two more new ones. But Robert Gates, uh, Robert Gates, when he retired, you, you know, and he's not exactly one of our close allies. <laughs> he said, anybody who's thinking about another war under these conditions ought to have their head examined. And I think American people would agree with him. You have time. Yes, sir. In the blue shirt, please. Uh, you made a very good point on why I better be the nominee if you care about this war. <laughs> yes, please, brown shirt. Well, we have no money, so we can't consider giving more money out. We're trying to save money. <laughs> We're not planning to give out more. But I would suggest that 
study history carefully. There, there have been other analysis on, on Lend-Lease and uh, uh, the uh, programs after the war, the stimulus. Uh, they're, they're not, it's not nearly, you know, as good as it was pan, played up to be. But we don't have that choice. We're, we're flat-eyed broke. We're doing it to save, save our country and to save our budget and save our economy. So we don't, uh, we don't have this obligation to squeeze more out of the American people. And the sooner we get back to being a productive society, maybe we'll set a good example and they'll follow our lead. But I think that's the most important thing we can contribute to. No, I would let the banks make their own decisions. I wouldn't prohibit them, but I wouldn't take money from these people to, uh, to do it. The, uh, the circumstances, uh, I mean, if there's a declaration of war, there's, it's a little bit different, you know, but uh, if you're just saying, well, there's two people fighting, in a way we do that constantly. It's not called Lend-Lease, but we give money all the time. And how many countries are we being involved? This administration is getting involved in Uganda now. And, you know, what I'm convinced of is that when you pick up foreign aid and you send it to these countries, you say, oh, yes, you, you can't be so cold and heartless. These people are starving, and uh, why can't we just send them food and, and help them out. Well, it turns out that they're always fighting. They're war factions. It becomes, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one person gets the side of it and it helps one side and not the others. And it, uh, it, it, it doesn't help. I am convinced that foreign aid is taking money from poor people in this country and giving it to the rich people in those poor countries. It doesn't work. Just a couple more questions, please. Uh, yes, on the, on the podium, please. We get, we get rid of the TSA. She wants to know how. Oh, TSA? Yeah. Well, you know, the TSA is a rather new invention, and I don't know too many Americans that enjoy going on airplanes anymore. <laughs> but, uh, no, say security... Security is the responsibility of the private owner. Uh, I live on the coast of Texas. We have hundreds of chemical plants, and security is run by the chemical plants. They have fences and guards and dogs and their own private police force, and they work with the local police. This was a whole problem that the airlines weren't protected because the government had already taken it over. They set the rules. They set the rules that uh, private airlines uh, pilots couldn't have guns. They, uh, they uh, emphasized don't ever resist and do what the hijackers tell you. So they set the stage for this. I would think that uh, responsibility falling on the, the owner, the person that's delivering our pa passengers around the country, maybe they treat us as, as, uh, as well as those people who are paid a lot of money to haul money around the country. Nobody seems to rob them. So I would say that the market would solve it and it would get out of this, uh, this violation of civil liberties. When the, when the airlines do it and they want to have some security measures, you don't like it, you just don't fly on airline, they'd have to accommodate the passenger. TSA doesn't accommodate the passenger, they like to annoy us. And it seems like on purpose. So that won't save any money. Thank you. Next question. Probably on some international flights that we should have knowledge about people coming from certain countries, yes. But uh, to, to run, run all the security for all the airlines, uh, no. I mean, it, in all the violations, and think of uh, the groping of little girls and elderly women and men as well. I mean, it is atrocious. It is atrocious what we put up with. Matter of fact, I've made a statement. If we as a people don't wake up and say, let's put a stop to what happens at our airports. I'm not all that optimistic, but I'm optimistic enough that the American people are getting to the point where they're sick and tired of that, of their violations of their civil liberties, violation of their wallets, and the violation of all their freedoms. Yeah. We have time for one more question, please. 
Any more questions? Going once. All right. Oh, yes, sir. Well, I think uh, you're talking about uh, doing some of these cuts outside of the military. I think that's where I would get the strongest support. And uh, the attitudes uh, have changed dramatically, you know, since the, uh, since the bubble burst. But there's still a ways to go. Uh, immediately, Republicans, what did they do? They had stimulus packages. They bailed out a car company. And then they also had TARP. Uh, but believe me. Do you think if the markets turn down next week and there's the, the next banking crisis, which is on our doorstep, we are a long way off from this, they're not going to do that again. The attitudes have changed. That's where I think I would get the support, especially on the economic issues and, uh, and, and cutting back on, on so many of these, realizing that debt is a problem. That is the big thing. We have to realize that we have to do with something with the debt. And you can't solve the problem of the debt by increasing the debt. The problem, I mean, it's, it's no more complicated than that. I think I would get a lot of support from the Republicans on that issue. Thank you all very, very much.